I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm welcoming you today from the city of Toronto, which is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And we are most grateful and appreciative of the important history of this land. Because so many of you are new to Mental Health Research Canada, I'm gonna take just a moment and share a little bit about our organization and our work with you. We are a national charity established in 2018, but we evolved from a 55 year old provincial organization. We have three general areas of our work. The first is studentships. We support early career researchers uh, to build the talent pool in Canada, and we do require our funded students to work directly with communities and people with lived experience. We also manage grant competitions for other organizations if they are interested in having their grants uh, be rooted in engagement with stakeholders and people with lived experience. And the third area of our work that has come into play since very early in the pandemic is data collection analysis and reporting. And part of what you're uh, hearing today is as a result of that. Uh, we are funded by our federal government, Health Canada, uh, to collect population data and analyze it and rapid report on it. Uh, and you will see if you visit our website, more than 60 reports uh, that have been produced in the last two years. So I invite you to visit our website at mhrc.ca. Uh, we're very excited that you've joined us today and we hope that uh, you will stay connected to us and perhaps sign up for our newsletter. In terms of the agenda today, we have some housekeeping items I'll go over in a moment, uh, but the purpose of the webinar today is to report on three new studies uh, that have been turned out recently uh, by MHRC in partnership with others. Uh, psychological health and safety assessment, uh, which is rooted also in guardian minds evaluation, psychological safety impacts of working in teams, and the impacts of trauma on the workplace. Uh, we'll also be talking about what resources are out there to support all of you in these areas, and we're hoping also for some time for Q&A at the end. Some housekeeping items, I believe are on the next slide. All of you are muted, uh, but we do welcome questions. So please put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. And I have colleagues that are managing both of those. Uh, we'll keep an eye on those and do the best that we can to answer some questions. Uh, this website is recorded. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, in the coming days. And throughout the presentation, you will see resource links through QR codes and web links. Uh, we're, we're providing this information to be useful to you, so we hope that uh, you may be interested in following up directly uh, and visit these resources and web, web links as well. There are the, the web addresses, and we put QR codes in to be helpful as well. Uh, if you are uh, wish to uh, participate in French, you can click uh, French subtitles uh, on the Zoom link, there's a way to do that, and we welcome that as well. We are an organization that does operate in both official languages, but this webinar is in English today. And now it's my distinct pleasure to be introducing to you uh, and turning over to the two key people that are going to be uh, sharing uh, their wealth of information with you today. Uh, the first is Marianne Baton, uh, someone that I don't see nearly enough of. Uh, Marianne, it's just delightful uh, to uh, see you here today, and I know that you work very closely with our teams. Uh, Marianne Baton, for any of you that don't know, uh, she's a very important leader in the area of workplace mental health in, in Canada. Uh, she's Chief Experience Officer of Marianne Baton and Associates, uh, and that's one hat she wears, and she wears many others. She is a Director of Strategy and Collaboration for Canada Life's Workplace Strategies for Mental Health. And I do want to also say at this moment, uh, MHRC is really grateful for the support of Canada Life. They've been a key partner on the work that we're doing in workplace mental health in partnership with Workplace Strategies. 
Marianne is also advisor to Mindful Employer Canada, senior consultant for My Workplace Health, and a list of many, many other important roles uh, that she plays where she's able to impart her wealth of information about healthy workplaces in Canada. Her work serves to support governments, employers, organizations, unions, teams, and associates, associations that wish to resolve any issues involving mental health, psychological safety in the workplace, conflict or performance concerns. And I could continue to talk for many, many more minutes okay. about many accomplishments and her expertise. So we're very <laughs> excited to have you with us today and for us to be working so closely with you. And also Michael Cooper, my colleague, uh, someone I have enormous respect for who's done tremendous work uh, at MHRC and leading all of our data projects. Michael works with a great team. Uh, I'm very, very proud of the people that we all work with. And our key goal is to make the data that we collect useful. Uh, and we do that through translating them into reports and infographics and many different forms so that stakeholders can benefit from the knowledge and hopefully apply it. Uh, overall, our goal is to support data-informed decision-making in Canada uh, through this work. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn over to Michael and Mary Ann. I know they have a lot of uh, great information to share, and I'm going to go off camera from this point on. Uh, thank you, and good luck. I know everyone's going to enjoy it. Thanks, Akila. Thank you, Akila. I always got a good look at that photo of me, and I just noticed there was a, a lot more gray in the two years since that was taken. I, I think uh, I think post-COVID has been uh, tough on me. <clears throat> Uh, well, Marianne, it's a pleasure to join you here today um, on this. And I think from a structural standpoint, um, I'm planning on going through a few of the findings in the reports um, and then really going to be leaning into Marianne to talk about um, what employers might want to look at for some of the specific challenges that were identified. Does this sound reasonable, Marianne? Uh, so far. So, so far. far. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're proud that in uh, earlier this year, um, we worked with Canada Life and Workplace Strategies and for Mental Health, uh, Marianne and her, her great team over there, and we collected a large-scale data sample of the Guardian Minds evaluation of the, the factors that impact workplace mental health. Um, a reminder that, uh, and Marianne, you can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but the Guardian Minds evaluation is available for free at, at guardianminds.ca or a website uh, similar to that. Um, supported, as I understand it, by CCOHS, um, and uh, and you can take your own evaluation there. Um, <clears throat> anything you wanted to add to the to the over just the first element here? Just to say that um, there was a report done on guarding minds that questioned its validity, and we um, were able to secure the work of Dr. Heather Stewart to evaluate it, to give us some advice on how to update it. And uh, and we're really proud of what it's doing now because it includes measurements of inclusion as well as stress and trauma at work. And we think for most employers, this is a very useful um, tool to help them start that journey on psychological health and safety. Great, thank you. And to reiterate, this is the new Guardian Minds evaluation. We did a one on the old Guardian Minds in <clears throat> 2021, 2022. Um, and this one is the new one that was done earlier this spring. Uh, so I think what we provided here is an overview of how we essentially evaluated it. Um, we used a five point Likert scale, which looked at the frequency of certain um, behaviors, items occurring in the workplace um, with the with the understanding that the more positive things that were occurring that supported uh, psychological health and safety workplace, health and health and safe workplaces, that we were looking at the frequency of occurrences of, of uh, that happening. So what you see on the right here are the, uh, the percentage of people who indicated often or always that these items that are occurring um, are often or always occurring in their workplace. Um, and what we found particularly interesting was items that uh, seem to have more legislation around them, specifically psychological protection and uh, protection of physical safety were indicating higher degrees of frequencies, while others that were less legislative in nature were actually lower. Um, of course, the, the lowest one that we did note was recognition and, uh, and reward at only 53% of workplaces saying that they regularly saw that occurring. 
Um, but we did see significant variances between age, work sector, um, ethnicities, and size of workplace. Um, and we did also uh, study for um, remote or hybrid work, uh, and we did sort of evaluate. And so what we've done um, is we have published a substantive report which looks at and breaks down by all of these categories, which you can pull up from that Guardian Minds website that MHR uh, mhrc.ca uh, slash guarding dash minds. And you can actually see all of the specific demographic factors uh, that we did analyze this against. It would be far too much to go into here. Um, but what we did uh, note that was particularly interesting, um, we have a lot of conversations about was the work that we found on hybrid and remote work, which was one of the things we found were scores actually improved the more remote you were. So if you were in person, your scores were decent, better if you were hybrid and then improved if you were fully remote. Um, although this only applied to two out of the three areas of management we considered. Non-management uh, non and executives were showing improvement, but mid-level management was not showing improvement across the hybrid question that we actually looked for there, which was something that we hadn't expected at all. Yeah, when we yeah, Sorry, I just wanted to comment on that last slide, Michael, to say Dr. Martin Shane has uh, long said that the whole of the standard should be legislated. And it's interesting that the two pieces that are quite well legislated, employers do better. Um, there's a lot of controversy around that. But just to say, my hope is employers will start to do this anyways, because it's good business sense and not wait for the hammer of legislation. But the other thing I wanted to say is there's been another big study that was done by Dr. Creedy Jane that um, backs up what we found around the hybrid work, which is um, interesting because there has to be now more studies done on what about the people who can't, who can't do hybrid work and what's the difference for them. So, yep, thanks. Nope, my pleasure. <clears throat> so we just pulled some of our key findings out for our, for the, um, uh, for the audience here. Uh, as I mentioned, um, when you're looking at this many variables and we looked at, you know, dozens of demographic variables, age, um, uh, a whole host of them, there are really, a near infinite number of things that we have plucked from this data. So we tried to actually find some of the most interesting ones. Um, <clears throat> we we uh, we did it, uh, find that, for example, educators and um, public safety personnel, I should stop calling this first responders, um, feel it is rarely or never safe to speak up at work, which basically means one out of people, one out of five, one out of people, one out of five people who work in these sectors indicate that there is rarely or never safe to speak up at work when they're having a challenge. And of course, this can lead to toxic work environments as well, too. We did find that first responders, or what I'm actually correctly, thanks to Dr. Nick Carlton from SIPSERT um, and his team there, keep reminding me, and I neglected to make the change on this presentation. Uh, public safety personnel scored very low across most factors. Um, and just to be clear, this is police, EMT, and firefighters, um, and not um, correctional services, which is one element we just didn't have enough to include them. Um, we we did indicate and find that there were significant levels of bullying um, within those sectors as well, too. Um, and both that's bullying coming from internal factors as well as from um, uh, the general public. We'll, we'll show a little bit of that during the trauma report. 48% um, of first responders, or more correctly, public safety personnel, I will get this right, um, indicating they're experiencing discrimination, um, verbal, physical, or sexual harassment, which again, we'll cover more thoroughly in the trauma report. Um, and then uh, we did see that this particular sector uh, say that our work threatens their psychological health. And it wasn't the only sector that indicated that there was a predominance of people that um, indicated that they uh, uh, their work is threatening their psychological health. I did see a, a hand going up. I'm going to ask everyone individually. I know it's pressing. Um, maybe we can stop at the end of each report and take a question or two. And then if we have a, a, a number of questions remaining, we'll take them at the end. Um, we do believe, and we did find that only a third of educators believe difficult situations at work are being dealt with effectively, um, which means two thirds are uh, believing that it's um, not being dealt with effectively as well. We did of course look at retail workers um, and uh, we did also identify that young people especially felt workload was unreasonable, about half of them, regardless of what sector they were in. Um, we did look at questions around, for example, turnover, 
Um, and we do note that healthcare and retail was indicating that there is significant uh, psychological health and safety implications from uh, turnover, which is causing a significant issue. In those sectors, we did look at loneliness. And again, this is where we saw young people were primarily indicating loneliness at work, um, as well as young people indicating that bullying um, is a problem at work with almost uh, two and a half times as many young people saying bullying is a problem as compared to those over the age of 55. And again, this was just working Canadian. So this would be people 55 to 50, 65, 67, um, and a few who are slightly older um, who would not be retired. Um, and uh, we found that about half of employees in large workplaces that were over 500 employees indicated they were experiencing a positive workplace culture, which is not great. Um, we did look at racialized Canadians as well, and we did note they feel less job security compared to non-racialized Canadians, um, and they feel um, less psychologically protected as well. So as I indicated earlier, uh, if we were to go through our 80 page deck on this um, and show all the variables, we were fine. We need about a day. Um, so uh, in talking to Marianne um, and knowing that we're getting a lot of questions about, well, what about my specific sector? What about my specific group? What we actually did is we made a fully searchable uh, database of the information. So if you go to our website, there's a link on the Guardian Minds page that says go to the data hub. Um, and if you go there, you can see you can actually sort the data and identify the probability of these things occurring by region. So that would be by province, um, uh, age, what age of the respondents, gender groups would be uh, anything from ethnicities to um, gender identification uh, um, and, and other groups. Um, I think we have I forget the groups that we have listed there, but there are many. We also um, if we had a sufficient sample size. We broke out all the industries, and I do think that's important because a lot of the questions we get from this is, can you tell me what's happening in the legal profession? Can you tell me what the psychological scores look like in the um, in the manufacturing sector? So all of those sort of larger industries would be identified under those that industry banner, and you'd be able to actually pull out the 13 uh, psychosocial factors that are uh, looked, here, looked at here and actually see the scores and compare uh, if you do your own evaluation, you can compare on a sector by sector basis, as opposed to comparing against everyone's scores as well. We do, of course, also provide opportunities to look at this by organization size, um, by executive level. So we do have non-management, mid-level management, and executive management as areas you can look at, as well as working from home. And you can actually filter with a couple of these tabs. Although if you pull in too many tabs and the sample gets too small, um, you'll get a... Um, you'll get a big error message that says the sample is too small. Um, it'll be right up in that top right corner there where it says sample size. And I would advise any sample under at least 60 would be too small to really properly evaluate. Uh, Marianne, I'm gonna throw it over to you with the uh, with an open question about, um, I, I pulled your website here from Psychological Health and Safety on Workplace Strategies. Any commentary you'd like to make on this site or, or what yes. people can discuss this? I think that it may seem very discouraging, the results that we had um, around psychological health and safety, that we're not doing that well in some places. But what I'd like to say to people that are trying to make a difference is, we, of course, we have to find out the people that are not satisfied, the people who are not safe, the people who um, are suffering, what's going on for them. But look to the people who are doing well uh, and find out why they are, because often we can learn more from the successful teams, from the um, parts of the organization where people are bonding together, where they are supporting each other, where they are being supported to do their best work. So rather than just look at what's wrong, to look at what's right and uh, the tools and things that are here for you um, can help you every step of the way. And um, just to reiterate, because I know people really don't believe this, that all of these tools and resources are free. There's no cost involved. There's no strings attached. It really is just that um, we'd like to see people improve working lives. Great, Marianne. And I took that opportunity to answer a few questions in Q&A while we had a moment there. 
Okay. Um, and, and again, um, I would strongly encourage individuals who are interested in psychological health and safety to take a look at the workplace strategies for mental health website, um, which is QR code here at right and on the webpage. Um, while we primarily look at um, evaluating what's going on in workplace mental health, um, we are not experts um, in terms of identifying solutions to these problems. So uh, if anyone asks the question of me of what should we do to address um, discrimination in the workplace, I would point you to someone else's great resources um, uh, and resources like this. Um, we we are here to evaluate whether it's happening or not. And then we lean on experts like Marianne to really identify um, how to specifically address challenges like that. Um, uh, I want to just yeah. mention for those that are interested in the national standard on psychological health and safety, it is being updated right now. And once it is, everything that's here will also be updated to align with it. But for those who have been implementing the standard for 10 years, don't stress. It's still all of your work will still be valuable and you will be able to make it, I hope, easier in the end um, with the changes that are coming. Okay, your microphone's off, Michael. Thank you. I do see there are a number of questions coming in. Um, I'll address a couple as we go, but I'll I'll save the most of them for the end of this as well too, since all these reports really do tie in together. Uh, the next report I wanted to cover is a report we issued, and again, I will get to these questions even if they're on this first report. I'm I'm happy to address them at the uh, as we get to the end here. Um, teamwork and psychological health report, which basically was looking at the impact of working in teams on mental health. It considers how teams functions, how comfortable people are working in teams, being valued in the existence of, the existence of discrimination and bullying. Uh, Marianne, I know that uh, Workplace Strategies for Mental Health and Canada Life were working on a specific teams um, a piece of work. Did you wanna outline what that was that sort of led to this work? Yeah, uh, sure. So it's called Psychologically Safe Team Assessment. And the reason that we created it was because um, we already have Psychologically Safe Leader Assessment, which is really about strategies that leaders take to support psychological health and safety. But we know that the leader can be you know, the epitome of perfection and caring. But if the team members aren't supporting each other, then it's never gonna be psychologically safe. The other thing that motivated us to um, start to look at teamwork was that inclusion can't be a policy. It has to be the way people interact on a daily basis. And so our psych safe teams assessment is very much grounded in the um, uh, psycho psychological health and safety factors. It's grounded in positive psychology principles about raising up the resilience of teams. And it's grounded in the um, evidence around inclusion and what it means. So it's really um, a great uh, add-on. And what we learned from the MHRC work is some of the things that are really critical um, and, and how we can make that assessment helpful. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I also skimmed through the chat while we were waiting here and we can make the presentation available. If you do want a copy of the presentation, um, uh, not just the recording of the video, um, just send us your email and we'll, we'll send it over to you as well too. Um, just to highlight a few things we noted on the front end of this report, uh, about three quarters of employed Canadians indicated that they work as part of a team. Um, so that's sort of the base group that we were looking at with this report. Um, we This report was a challenging report from um, a data analyst perspective because we're always looking for variability. What groups are struggling more than others? Who needs more help? Who needs um, Who's feeling more challenged? Um, we, we didn't find a tremendous amount of variances between um, some of the factors that we looked at in terms of um, uh, teams. Uh, but what, one of the things we did identify is that one of the largest uh, factors was age. Um, so younger people were were feeling that they were um, more psychologically challenged working in teams, while older people felt that there was less of a psycho psychological challenge in working in teams. We did identify um, rates of discrimination and bullying that we thought were higher than we were expecting as well. 
Um, for example, um, you know, we did find that approximately 25% of people aged 18 to 34 indicated that their, uh, their team is not free from discrimination. That's one in four young people indicating that there's, they're seeing discrimination on a, at least a semi-regular basis on this as well. Um, and I think, I think the other thing looking apart from the discrimination, the bullying, um, and, uh, feeling valued is when we looked at these um, eight factors uh, that we looked at, uh, these eight questions, I think the accountability one being only 66% of people indicating that team members are held accountable, that lack of accountability can, can lead to challenging teams as well too. Um, and of course, one thing we did identify as well is that um, we did see significant differences between managers and non-managers in comfort in speaking up when they don't agree. And I, I don't think that's particularly unexpected, um, but we were able to identify that as well, too. I'll leave this up for a second if anyone wants to pull these numbers down. Mary yeah, I, I'd just like to put out a call to action. And for anybody who is 55 or older, to really recognize that um, we struggled as parts of teams when we were younger, not knowing where we fit in, maybe speaking up and getting slammed down or ridiculed. And I'd really like to suggest that if you're 55 and older, that you take it upon yourself, no matter what position you're in, to try to make a difference on how everybody feels on your team. I'm not talking about leaders necessarily, but just those people, we've been there, done that. We don't need to watch other people suffer like we did. We can, we know better and we can do better in making our team feel included. Thank you, Mary. And I, I do think that it's fascinating to me when I look at this, the differences between all team members are held accountable with only two thirds of people agreeing with that happening in the workplace versus, you know, things are at least happening respectfully 80% um, of the time or 81% of the time. So I do think there's some interesting variances within the questions that were asked here, but we don't see it from a demographic standpoint in terms of significant variance or even across the sectors, although there are a few outliers that we saw here and there. Yeah, well, there's that fake politeness, right? Where it's like, oh, it's respectful. Oh yes, well, you know, I just, I wonder if you thought about this and what they're doing is ridiculing somebody. So you can be so-called respectful or look respectful but not really being inclusive or kind. Fantastic. Um, and I, I, by the way, earlier you mentioned that psychological safe leaders assessment. Um, before I get here, we have that on our website as well. We've done that work with you. We didn't do it this year. We did it last year, the year before. Time is confusing at the end of COVID. Um, but uh, but we've done that psychological safe leaders assessment, if anyone's interested in seeing the results of that study as well. And we did that both from the leader's perspective, but we asked people who were non-leaders to look at the psychological safe leadership that they're um, their management was providing to them. So we have a bit of information on that as well. Uh, this slide here is where we pulled your resources off the Workplace Strategies uh, website for the uh, the assessment. Um, and again, this is where you could do the assessment that, that we've done the large scale across all Canadian workplaces. And you could compare yourself to the responses we've seen, um, the benchmarks we've established uh, through this psychological safe teams assessment. And am I correct? This is where you can find support tools as well, Marianne? Yeah. So even if you say, well, we're not, we're not doing surveys in our place or we don't have the ability to do it. If you go to this link, it gives you all of the questions. And for every single question, there's um, an idea or a resource on what you can do about that to make it better. And there's something we call explore further, which is, well, what if you get people that say, well, the, I'm experiencing discrimination and you go, well, that's terrible, but I don't know who said it. I don't know what it is. We even give a script that you could send out by email saying, we've heard that there may be, and we'd like to know if you've witnessed it or if you've experienced it. And here's an anonymous way for you to give me that feedback. So we really help the leaders, not just to do the assessment, but to follow up and to make change that uh, is sustainable. Um. And this was the third and final report we want to speak to today. Um, and again, all of these reports are fully available on our website. Um, each one of them could be the subject of a fulsome webinar. 
um, and we're just trying to provide a a bit of a, an overview of what's inside of all of these reports. Um, and we would encourage people to read it at their uh, their leisure um, and uh, take a look at this. I, I just, this report, by the way, was I, I was particularly excited to work on because I haven't seen a lot of great um, uh, sector-wide, um, broader uh, studies of trauma and stress in the workplace, specifically looking at things like causes of trauma, is trauma still affecting you? Um, uh, is it impairing your ability to do work? We've been working on our National Health Canada funded um, collection on mental health indicators. And we look at something called the Sheehan Disability Scale, which looks at the percentage of people who are feeling impaired at work um, or missing days at work. And it's about eight to 9% of people uh, every week are missing work as a result of mental health and about 22% of them are indicating that they're significantly impaired at work. Um, and you know, while that is not entirely all stress and trauma, of course, um, we know that stress and trauma is a significant contributing factor to those sorts of uh, scales. And you can understand that those are not just um, looking at the, the micro, those have significant impacts on companies in terms of productivity, bottom line, their ability to implement their mission, make money, whatever they're doing. Um, but when you look at it, the macro, it is a huge amount of lost GDP for Canada um, because of challenges that we have from trauma and stress in the workplace as well. Um, so from this report, we, uh, by the way, Marianne, anything you disagree with on that or a little bit of, a, <laughs> of an editorializing there? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's disturbing to me that yeah. almost a quarter of Canadians have experienced psychological trauma at work. I think that's horrendous. I mean, obviously stress, like that's to be expected, but an actual trauma, um, given the definition of that, I think that we need to do a lot more to prepare people psychologically to withstand these traumatic incidents. If we know that they're going to happen, then they should be ready psychologically to endure them without the long-term impacts. I think the, uh, and just answer one question right off the bat, I get 100% of the time. Yes, we define trauma at the front end of this, these questions so that people can identify what trauma is at least in asking them, trying to understand what it is so that they can properly answer this question. Uh, I think from my perspective, I had certain um, understandings that there were workplaces that, you know, trauma may be unavoidable, and then you're doing mitigation um, versus prevention. But I think there was some that I was surprised that trauma was so prevalent in those sectors as well, um, which we'll get to here. So just uh, of the, uh, as, as Marianne mentioned, 22% of Canadians said they have experienced the psychological trauma at work. And of those 22%, 38% uh, of those, so about 40% of, you know, 22% have indicated that they are still feeling impacted from that trauma and it's impacting their ability to work. Yeah, we that, did, yeah. Sorry, Michael, that last statistic though, my curiosity is how long has it been since the trauma? Because still being impacted if it's in the first year or two would make sense. For those who are longer, um, then it, is it something else? And yeah, I'm curious. We we could dig further into that one. Absolutely. It might be worth another follow-up to look at that. We we did identify that trauma was more common among racialized Canadians, younger people, uh, pe people and members of the LGBTQ2S plus community. Um, and we did see that trauma was significantly more um, common in industries such as healthcare, public safety personnel, and education. Um, and of course, retail had a higher level of trauma as well. When we looked at the major causes of trauma in the workplace, we actually found that 46% of people who indicated that they were experiencing trauma indicated it came from customers or clients. 29% said it came from coworkers. 27% said the trauma was primarily driven by direct manager. Um, and 18% uh, said some sort of an accident. So you can actually understand that a lot of these traumas are not actually accidents, which is how I think a lot of people would initially think about trauma, but a lot of it is actually being driven by behaviors in the workplace, customers, clients, or people you work with from your management to your coworkers. And, and really that's more than half are internally driven by a coworker, direct manager. That's horrendous. 
Because yes, we think about first responders and they're going to a car accident or a fire and that can be traumatic to them in many ways. But we don't in anticipate that we're going to be traumatized by the people that we work with. And of course we have laws and, and we have um, policies, but something's not happening properly that this can continue. Uh, so while accident-based trauma is, ap is basically building on this point, while accident-based trauma is often discussed, trauma for management, executive policies and coworkers seems to be um, more lasting. So we did analyze, for example, um, uh, whether or not, based on the source of trauma, um, be it customers, clients, coworkers, managers, accidents, executives, workplace policies, or compromised values, the ones that seem to be more lasting um, in terms of they say it still affects me were were ones like values being compromised. It still affects me. Workplace policies, 58% of people who said that trauma was due to workplace policies um, said it still, in fact, uh, still affects them. And then senior executives were another one. But like um, what we found was trauma that was inflicted, for example, by an accident or customers or clients was far less likely to for people were to say that that trauma is still affecting them. I'm hoping this slide makes sense. Do you know why it makes sense is because an accident can't be, it, it, by the nature of it being an accident, you're less likely to either feel you're being blamed or to feel that there was something really unfair about it happening to you. And we're, and we're also not subjected to the same risk day after day after day as we are with these other uh, categories. Perpetual ones. Yeah. Right. Um, excuse me. When we asked um, respondents, um, what was the, the thinking of the support provided by your employer to those who've experienced trauma at work? Please tell us what that support looks like and if it was helpful. And the um, uh, what we found and heard heard back most was um, we were getting paid time off. We accessed the EAP program, counseling, psychological support, phone support, positive encouragement, um, access to group benefits, resources, and then using third party resources. And we've selected a few uh, quotes here left from the open ended responses here um, to give you a sense of what people were saying when they've experienced the trauma what has their workplace done for them or what have they done to deal with that trauma? And these were the most common responses. The most common responses, but the ones that were most passionate because there were many, many of them are the ones where the people at work were supportive. So yes, we can send people away to a third party to say, well, you were traumatized at work, sucks to be you, here you go. But when we can be supportive, be understanding, not only does it help the person to stay a contributing member, but it helps them to work through the trauma um, in a much better way than when they're being judged or feel like they're a burden. And then I've shared here, sorry, I'm getting over a, a cough. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sharing here the resources that Marianne, your website has here on trauma. Do you want to speak to a little bit about what sort of resources you have available on workplace yeah. strategies uh, toward specific to this issue? Sure. So the, the trauma in organizations is obviously for leaders. And we had the help of trauma specialists, people that um, uh, provide counseling for those who have been traumatized, people who work in public safety personnel organizations and help prepare people for this. So it's some really good, concrete, practical approaches to trauma, as well as the piece about being trauma informed, meaning that we need to expect that um, people, and we know at least one in four um, are likely to have experienced trauma either at work or at home. And to think about what does that mean in the way that we treat them and trigger or, or not. And then there's another piece that's available for someone who has already been traumatized. And it's about managing yourself when you know that you're likely to be triggered at work. What are some of the things you can do? And again, some of that came from the evidence, but some of that came from people with lived experience who say, this is how I manage to keep going to work every day, even though I've experienced this. 
Um, and with that, I think we've covered off the basics of the reports. <laughs> um, again, these reports are extensive um, and uh, we've done them in injustice by only showing a couple snippets of bullets from each one. Um, but the, the questions that can come from this are essentially near infinite. So I would ask anyone, if you're interested in the psychosocial factors that are impacting workplace mental health, go to the Guardian Minds website on MHRC's website, um, read the report if you're interested in looking at it in, a, in that format, or if you're interested in looking to compare against specific groups, use the data hub. Um, it does get a little bit slow when there's hundreds of people accessing it at the same time, but it, it has never not worked. So it should, it should be fine for you. Um, as it pertains to the team's report, that is also there. Um, and then the trauma report, again, you can read the trauma report. That was the most recent one that we just put out. If you're on our mailing list, you would have received a copy of it. If you're not on our mailing list, you can go to our website and join our mailing list and you will get all of our reports as we publish them. We publish, I don't know, 25 reports a year, quite, quite a good deal of number of reports across mental health. Um, so this is a way you can access those sorts of reports. I see we have 68 current questions that have uh, piled up in the um, in the uh, chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to see if we can address them um, one at a time. So if you have a question or uh, please put it in the Q&A or chat now. Uh, Marianne, do you wanna answer this question? Cause I think you could, I, I have an answer but yours is better than mine, I'm sure. I am wondering what the difference is between any between mental health and psychological health. I, mean, I want a second. Whatever you say, I want a shot at this too. Yeah. Okay, okay. I I would say that they're virtually the same thing. Um, mental illness um, is something different, but mental health and psychological health are virtually the same thing. And what we want, what the reason that we use the phrase psychological health and safety when we started with the standard is because if we said mental health, people automatically think about people with a mental illness and psychological health and safety is the employer's responsibility to protect all employees from damage to their psychological well-being, not just to protect employees that may be vulnerable to mental illness. Go ahead, Michael, what would you um, say? I'm also seeing people are raising their hands. I'm gonna do this in the order of the Q&A, then the chats in the comment, and then raising your hand uh, if we have time. Um, the one thing I wanna highlight, by the way, I don't disagree with anything you just said, um, is that I feel like that term mental health is regularly misused. Um, it is an encompassing term that should utilize questions around resiliency, um, capacity to manage stress, normal, like you can, you can have a, bad situation and feel depressed and you're not mentally ill, but that is talking about your mental health. So I do think that um, it is critically important that we understand that the term mental health is encompassing of a spectrum of experience, while it's often used to describe those who have a mental illness. Um, and, and we need to be careful that we understand that it is a broader term than just illness. So I'm gonna say that one was answered. Um, is there an ideal value, 47% is low for positive workplace culture? Uh, I, I I don't know if you have an answer to that, Marianne. We put 47 was low because we compared it to, I, I think it was for younger people who said that they're uh, only 47% said they had a positive workplace culture. We said it was low compared to older populations, people 35 to 54 or 55 plus. So that's what we mean when we see, say low. Um, if you're asking me what I think an appropriate level of positive workplace culture is, um, I, I think it's inherent to say that less than, I, as a baseline, half of workplaces having a positive workplace culture is not acceptable. Um, I don't know what the ideal number would be, but it's definitely more than half. So Marianne? Well, ideal, I would say would be like 92%. And the reason I say that is because statistically they say 8% of us are struggling at any given time. So if we're struggling for any reason, personal, um, or health reasons, then we're not going to think that we're less likely to think that the culture is positive. So if I'm an employer, that's what I'd be aiming for is 92% would make me feel like we're doing really well. Now, anything for me, less than 75%, and I would feel like I need to 
put a lot of effort into this because if I have a quarter of my staff who are unsatisfied, I can't afford to lose that amount of talent at any given time. So yeah, ideal 92. Um, Very specific number. Uh, the next two questions are related. I can't answer this, but uh, I'm curious to how you're going to answer this. Is there a timeline for the release of an updated national standard there is um, a general timeline and it's going to be 2025. So the work is commencing um, as we speak, a lot of work's being done, but I would say somewhere between January and the fall of 2025 would be when you would see it. Now the public consultation will happen before then. And I encourage everybody on this call to watch for that. That's your opportunity to see what's being thought of, to comment on it in advance. And every single comment must, by the rules of the standards making organizations must be considered. So yeah. But no, for sure, 2025. Um, I'm going to cheat a little and add my own question in here. Um, and and really what I think it'd be helpful is I'm, I'm assuming like the vast majority of people on this call know what the national standard for psychological uh, safety in the workplace is. Could you give us a 30 second description of it for the small fraction of people on this call who may not know what that is? Sure. So it's really a take from the occupational health and safety standards on, you know, it's a plan, do, check, act kind of framework where you must assess for um, risk. You must then take measures to mitigate that risk or in other words, to either eliminate it or reduce it. And this is a continual loop. So you plan to take action and make assessments. You do by taking the action, making improvements. You check by measuring and evaluating what you've done. And then you act. Um, and it just goes around and around. So it's just a continual framework to protect the psychological health and safety of employees, similar to how we protect the physical health and safety of employees. Um, thank you, Marianne. I'm gonna answer this next one. Will this presentation recording be shared after? Absolutely, yes. Um, and uh, we'll probably send a follow-up email to all the registrants offering them the video. And I'm hoping um, uh, my comms team is in the audience. I suspect we'll probably put this on our private YouTube channel and share it on our website as well too, probably. But everyone who's attending here will get, will be available to get it. Um, okay, next question. Are people overusing the word trauma and how do you manage an employee who claims to have trauma without a medical diagnosis? So it's the same, my answer is the same as people who claim to have a mental illness and you think, oh, I don't think you really have it. Anybody who's claiming to have something wrong with them is obviously needing something. Your job isn't to diagnose. Your job isn't to become a therapist. Your job is simply to say, that sounds like a lot for you. There's people that are better qualified than me that can help you. Do you want me to put them in touch with you? And how can I help you to be able to do your job while you're still here? Because that's your, your role, is to support someone in spite of whatever they're going through to be able to successfully contribute. And I know in the case of mental illness, that can be the kindest thing you do for them, not decide whether their diagnosis is correct or not, but rather just help them to be successful in doing their job. They don't need your pity. They don't need your um, assessment they need you to help them to keep that job and uh, stay respected in the workplace. Um, I couldn't say any better myself, so I'm not going to try. Um, last question, and I, I speak at a lot of workplace safety uh, conferences and events, and I, I see this question a lot. Are long-term disability claims our highest, I'm assuming you mean long-term disability, mental health, or psychologically safe uh, Claims are highest for people 18 to 34. I'm assuming you don't mean disabilities like um, workplace injuries or anything along that lines. Um, you might want to clarify that. Uh, yeah, okay. So our long-term claims around trauma, mental illness, mental health uh, are highest for people aged 18 to 34. Why would you say 
this is? Um, I got an answer for this, but Marion, you go first. Yeah, um, I'm, and I'm only speculating that yeah. they have less impetus um, in coming back to a job that maybe is paid very low, where they have very little respect, where they feel that they're bullied, they're not able to speak up, and uh, yeah, so that they're they're less interested in returning to that job um, than others. And, and I will add a little bit of the mental health component to this. We do find in our overall tracking of mental health indicators that young people are consistently showing more negative mental health than older generations. Um, interestingly enough, um, they are consuming far more mental health content. They're far more aware of their mental health, although they're not necessarily more literate around their mental health. They are consuming far more content around it and therefore more likely to speak about it or consider it as a challenge that they may be having. So there are some differences around this. And we have noticed that the negative indicators around younger people's mental health um, actually predate the pandemic. There's a StatsCan study that shows around 2015, there was a significant um, decline in negative and mental health, which has continued till now among young people. So I, I do think that there may be aspects of it that are related to the specific job and the challenges they may be having in the job. But I also think that there may be a difference in terms of young people's overall mental health as well, and their, therefore their resiliency to some of the challenges and the traumas that they may experience. Yeah, um, and they, Michael, just you brought up the point about that they consume more information. And I know from my experience, the younger people I know, they're much more literate about it. They're much less stigmatized about it. Correct, and, yes. Yeah, and I, like I think about my parents and their cohort and the drinking and the violence and the um, back problems and the headaches and the things that they would say were the reasons they couldn't work that may or may not have been also mental health and just never described that way. So I'm not sure that some of these statistics tell the whole story. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to the, by the way, I feel like we could debate this for a while, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on to the questions um, in the chat. And then what, when we have left, I'll get to the panelists. Um, uh, Keila, they want to know if she went to school in Brampton. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, is it possible to get a recording from the first webinar in this series? Michael, yep. Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Um, sorry, Akila. Uh, is it possible to get the recording from the first webinar in this series? I think we're not doing a series here. This was a one-off. We've done several other webinars. You'll have to be more specific as to which recording you want. Marianne and I have spoken on a few webinars. I'm sure um, MHRC has done several webinars around workplace mental health. I don't know which one, because this isn't part of a series. Uh, French subtitles were taken care of. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, may we rec receive a copy of the slides? Yes. Um, thank you, Shauna, for sharing the data hub on the chat. Uh, do, 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 do. Can, Can we... I just add, Michael, that yep. we now use your data hub as the benchmark for guarding minds, whereas we used to put it right in the report. This way they can go and they can get a benchmark that's more closely aligned with their own workplace. So thank you so much for that because it's an ongoing uh, value add for us. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad it's useful. Um, can you include all websites in the chat that come up on the presentation slides? Um, if someone from my team hasn't done that, can they go through the presentation um, and uh, add all the links to the bottom? Uh, please email me a copy of the presentation. Presentation. Wow, a lot of you want the presentation. I can appreciate that because we did go a little fast. Um, yes, we'll send a link to the recording, presentation slides. Many of you want the slide deck. Okay. Um, I would be curious to know how the vaccination status fits in here as it was widely accepted to discriminate those who made their own choices. Even the media promoted the bullying. We did nothing on vaccination status in this. So we have no, no answer to that question. Uh, Psychological Safe Leaders Info uh, to, uh, yes, that's on our website. I'm hoping someone on my team has grabbed this email and we'll send that over to them. Uh, okay, do, do. Presentation, 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 presentation. 
I should have just put a Google link to it. My apologies. I did not realize this many people would want the presentation. That is on me. Um, how many respondents in the, we did 5,508, 80, something like that. Yeah, there were just over 5,500 respondents. Are you able to share the definition that was given for trauma? Um, Haley, please email me or uh, mcooper at mhrc.ca. I will pull that from the uh, the survey and send that over to you. Oh, no, Brittany, never mind. Brittany, you're on top of it. You actually sent it in. It's from Cam H. Yeah, okay. Never mind. Da, 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 da. Amazing. Everyone thinks you're great, Marianne. Nobody's <laughs> They're obviously great. not relatives, right? It's okay. It's okay. I'll I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. I think we got through all the chat. That's it. There's just a lot of people asking for the thing. And now, do I have any hands still up? I have two hands still up. Um, let me see if I can find the hands. Uh, Jose, did you? Are you there? Are you? Do you want to ask the question? Jose Lacarte, I see a question from you, but you're muted. Okay, I'll uh, I'll go back to Jose in a minute. Uh, I see Jose Telefer. I'm going to allow you to talk. Jose, did you uh, did you want to ask a question? Is still oh, there. Not oh, muted. okay. Your hand was up. Okay. I will lower the hands then. <laughs> all right. Uh, then I see we've addressed all the questions. Um, is there any other questions that anyone wanted to ask? No more questions. In that case, We'll get a little bit of time back. Uh, Marianne, as always, I appreciate your insights. I learn so much every time we talk together. I'm just a data nerd who uh, looks at whatever things you ask me to look at. And I appreciate all the insight you provide as a subject matter expert on this front. Well, you are grace under pressure, Michael. Thank you. And just a quick thank you from me, Marianne. Uh, very much appreciate you taking the time. We know how very, very busy you are, and we continue to tremendously value our partnership with you. So thank you uh, for collaborating with us, and we look forward to many more uh, points of intersection as we move forward. Yeah, me too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.